The kid who grew up in the streets of Peoria when mother was a whore. His dad was a pimp. Come on. Guys beat the shit out of him. What did that do? Eliminated all the bull****. Richard had a view of life that was always based on truth. You distort the truth, you make fun of the truth, you bend the truth, you twist the truth, you run over the truth, but there has to be truth in it. It's, a, it's an amazing thing, actually. This is incredible. Hello, this is Chuck Braverman uh, on the latest episode of West Stock Online. This, I believe, is episode number 25. And um, if you're watching this on somewhere other than uh, West Stock Online, you know, like YouTube or something like that, please like and subscribe, which I never say, which I guess I should now, so you'll be notified. There's a little bell icon there that'll just tell you when a new episode comes up. So I'm going to put these on YouTube moving forward. Um, today, I, I, you know, it's interesting thinking about how do I find the talent that I have for this show. And this particular episode is not that different, except I, I saw a trailer for a film and I thought, gee, I, that looks pretty good. And I did a little research and got a hold of the film and, of course, the film paid off you know uh, there's an old saying I used to make trailers and I remember they used to say sometimes that the better the trailer the worse the movie and vice versa but in this case it's not so uh, the film is I am Richard Pryor I believe that it's currently running on the Paramount Network and we'll find out from sure when we speak to the director writer Jesse James Miller and there you are Good morning. Hello. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? You are, I'm seeing you, I'm in Southern California and you are in Vancouver, I believe. Is that right? I'm, I'm actually in, on the Sunshine Coast, which is right near uh, Vancouver. Well, I'm from Vancouver, but I'm just visiting family on, on the weekend. Oh. As you can hear the, the birds right there. What's the Sunshine Coast? Is that a, is that the name of a town or an area or what? It's actually, uh, parallel to the Vancouver Island it, it's part of the mainland but it's it's just a hidden secret that we don't want too many people to understand so they don't come here in droves which they already do so I told you uh, when we had a brief phone conversation that I I spent a month in Vancouver uh, directing an episodic show and it was just a spectacular wonderful uh, beautiful city I, I guess we shouldn't tell anybody that because you don't want to it's like well LA. it's already over, it's already overrun so it, 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 the 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 bag is out of, out of it, it's it's so it's so it's done it's housing done. housing yeah. used to be really cheap and available no. ev everywhere right and now no, it's, it's just, uh and now it's, it's like the little condos are a million plus right yeah yeah no vancouver is definitely discovered yeah sure. um so Jesse, you, I mean, I'm looking at your bio and it says you were born of American hippies in 1970 on a remote island. Um, and then you made a film about your American exodus, my American exodus. Um, yeah. Tell me about, I mean, and I'm fascinated by your name too. I'm sure people have asked you before. I mean, how does your name, and I, I, I will, I'll let you tell me the name of your children, which are unusual also. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Draft Dodger, well, conscientious objector as a father who, uh, who and a mother from Santa Monica. So they uh, took off during the, the, uh, the draft and, and uh, I was born on Malcolm Island, which is, is pretty far up in, uh, the coast, a little island called Santula um, and my name well I don't know I mean I gotta blame it on my parents Jesse James Evan Miller 
Uh, James was a friend of my dad's uh, who passed away recently. Um, but that's about all I got for my name. I, I got to blame it on my parents. Uh, my my oldest son is Cian, C-I-A-N Miller, and my uh, youngest is Keen, Keen Miller. So I have the traditional uh, angle of confusing people to carry forward. So you're unusual in that, and th I discovered this after the fact, because we, we don't know each other before the last couple of days, is that you're a hybrid, really. I noticed, yeah. That, yeah, and there are very few of us, and, I, and I'm very proud of the fact that I'm a hybrid too, and that is somebody who is proficient in fiction as well as nonfiction. Yeah. And I, I didn't realize that, especially after I, I saw the list of fantastic documentaries that you've directed, um, and very high quality and beautifully shot, and wonderfully put together. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the Richard Pryor doc and how that came about and maybe some of the production notes and then I'll, I'll run the trailer for it. Sure, sure. Um, how it came about is I just was offered the, the, the gig, which is fortunate for me. Um, every once in a while I get offered something that I don't have to create uh, from conception. Um, it, it was a tough one to say yes to at first because a Richard's been, uh, there's, I think three prior docs on his life and B just, he's super layered, super complex. Um, in order to tackle any story, I got to sort of really get engrossed in it. So it was, it was one of those decisions that took me a couple weeks to, to say yes to, but, um, it was just because of the complexity of the subject that I was more uh, concerned about in terms of me diving into. Um, as Chuck said, I, I come from, I'm a hybrid filmmaker, I guess we call ourselves now. I'm not quite sure what to call myself. Uh, I go from nonfiction to fiction all the time, and, and it's just been the way it's worked over the years. So for my doc filmmaking experiences, I want to try and bring my theatrical kind of conceptions, uh, reenactments sometimes as in Wonder Woman and um, et cetera. So that was really a interesting part of the prior experience was wanting to bring uh, Richard's um, voice into the uh, story because I just noticed that there's so much archive of him on his records and, and interviews and talking and and the movies and, and he just said it was such a crossover uh, genius that I wanted to bring that in so it enabled me to sort of film sort of little sections of, of him at, at the radio station in Berkeley and so I could you know we didn't have a big budget but I could film kind of the placeholders for that story to take place. So let's take so, a look at the trailer and uh, yeah. then we can comment on it. Sometimes I feel like there's a person, Richard Pryor, and he does all this comedy. And then there's me, and I wonder what I have to do with Richard. One of the most brilliant comedy minds in existence, Mr. Richard Pryor. I'm looking at an oblivious genius. Richard Pryor is not conservative by any stretch of the imagination. Richard had a view of life that was always based on truth. You distort the truth, you make fun of the truth, you run over the truth, but there has to be truth in it. My father died fucking. My father came and went at the same time. It so moves an audience to find a performer who shares their vulnerability with you. They're laughing, but also suddenly you're a raw nerve. This ain't as funny as we thought it was gonna be. The kid that grew up in the streets of Peoria, his dad was a pimp, my mother was a whore. Hello, little boys, your mother home, I like a blowjob. As soon as he's off stage, he really didn't know how to operate in the world. Drugs allowed him to be something other than himself with the memory of that childhood. I was told by many people that this is a troubled artist and you should stay away from him. I didn't get caught yesterday buying seven pounds of cocaine in front of eight police. 
The phone drops. Richard had run through the kitchen on fire. So what's that? Richard Pryor running down the street. One day he got up and go, you know what? This is bullshit. I have some stuff to say. I could have been prejudiced. Pimps, poverty, racism. He took all that dark shit and made it light. He kicked the freedom of speech door wide open. That was a hidden world that people didn't know about. And Richard Pryor put it on wax and made it beautiful. Take me now, Lord. Take me now. God, save my life. Take me, take me, take me. He made us all realize that we're humans. And that's the brilliance of Richard. What you taking my picture for? He turned out to be kind of a genius to turn your pain into comedy. I feel the tension from y'all. Y'all want me to do so well. But let's relax and enjoy whatever the fuck happens. There you yeah, go. It brings back, you know, having just watched the film, it's, uh, it was actually, it was actually a sad film. <laughs> You know, yeah. it, it, it's it was exciting to watch to, because you had some great clips of Pryor, and I learned a great deal. Even though I was a, I was always a big fan of his, I had forgotten things about him, and um, his humor is is just so good. And yet, it's as Rocco said in the clip there, there's just such an element of truth in everything that he was saying. It's heavy. Yeah, well, I mean, Rocco was great. Um, yeah, it was, it, Pryor's a heavy guy, man. I mean, he was doing stuff back 50 years ago, 40 years ago that just, you know, even today is relevant. So whenever you can pull somebody out of history like that and, and realize that they're still, they're saying stuff that's relevant today, it's, it's just mind boggling. And that's, that's the genius of Pryor. Well, it's yeah. funny. It's kind of funny in a way that when you look at something that's, I don't, can't do the math right away, but, you know, some of his stuff was 40 years ago, right? Yeah. And you think, wow, wow did he say that? Did he do that? Yeah. Did anybody say that or do that 40 years ago? Because we're still no. pushing the boundaries here of, you know, I guess we go back and forth. You know, being more yeah, not concerned. much is not much has changed. I mean, you know, I mean that's one of the shocking. I think at South by Southwest at the screening, we we screened the the feature version, which I prefer. Um, uh, nothing against the cut down version, but it's it's hard on a filmmaker when you cut thirty minutes out of a film on him or her. Um, yeah, it was a stunned audience. I mean, you know, like. It's a heavy film, and Pryor was a heavy guy. He was he was joking about stuff that happened to him personally, and that hurt him, you know. Um, but there's lots to learn from this man now, you know. There's there's a few, you know Martin Luther King and these types of icons. We can go back in their work. And we can go, hey, this is this is relevant now. Like, what were they saying? What should we be listening to? And we should be listening to people like Pryor, you know. Um. The, the 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 photographing of the interviews was so well done and so nicely put together and it also seemed to me after watching the whole film that a lot of people that you photographed were in large open spaces some kind of a warehouse yeah. setting some a very large apartment i mean did you rent space to photograph these people yeah. was, how did that yeah. well that that's all st a platform style platform i try and try and um create a motif for each one of my films as possible as much as possible so uh with prior i felt like he was elegant as a person and in, in his art and i wanted to um not just go to comedy clubs and do the regular so a lot of those were sets that we built um, it is tough, man. It's tough because halfway through your shooting, all of a sudden you're like, what is this place we're about to shoot in? So, you know, we, we brought in, um, panels and art deck and, and, uh, you know, couches and the whole nine yards for a lot of those interviews and built in the background. 
in to keep the motif going to keep the motif going well right? it definitely yeah. had a great look to it which was which was terrific um the dp was uh sean lawless and uh, a couple others um yeah i work i work with these guys for a number of years now and sean just did punk with me and um which was a completely you know different look uh it's important for me i i think the tone for me is really important. I, I don't mean this to, to stomp on anybody's. It just for me, it's really important for a doc to, to look good. Those days are over for me personally, where, you know, there's the non lit situation. I just like lighting stuff and making it look beautiful. That's, that's just my, my way. So, so, out of curiosity, from a director's point of view, a producer, director, when you go to shoot any one of those people and they all, had a great look to him. You get there at nine o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock, and what time are you ready to shoot? How long does it take you to set up your crew? And how, how big is your crew? Well, we do a full prep day before. We, we fly in uh, with enough time to do location scouts. So on the location scouts, we uh, spend our time planning out the, the look and the, and the camera angles the day before. Um, you know, sound's always an enemy of, of documentary filmmaking, so that's taken into context. So I, I travel with the sound person and my DP and an AC. Um, by the time we show up the next morning, uh, it's usually a three or four hour lighting setup. And b depending on the day, you know, I try and keep them minimal to two, two interviews a day at the most. We used to, back in the day, it used to be one interview a day. Now it's like, producers try and get three in there because they're whittling down you know it costs a lot of money for the day i'd, I'd say prior we had uh crews of 13 to 15 on punk we were up there about oh, 18 to 20. wow what did the crew consist of that's 15 people to 20 people you mean grips uh, gaffers makeup yeah. hair wardrobe yeah Pretty much all those I just said with ACs and. Well, you're going to upset uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, do-it-yourself. <laughs> well, I come two-man two crews, you know. I, so. I do that too, you know. Like I, I don't want to. These are just specific to the films you're talking about. I mean, Exodus I shot for three grand, and I did. I shot it. I, I did everything. I, I was just by myself. So that's where I come from. I'm also an editor, so I've cut most of my stuff, except for uh, Graham Q, who's a fantastic editor, and I hate to say his name out loud because I don't want to get poached, but um, he cut um, prior, and he was instrumental in a lot of the style. Uh, Sean Tozer, who's been working with me for, God, 12 years is my composer. Uh, not mine, but a, a composer, I, I should say, is super, super talented. So I so, just work with really talented people. So living in Canada, and again, and you're a dual citizen, I, I believe, is yeah. it, uh, does it, how is the, you know, you seem to be really busy. Are uh, half the projects, would you say, c Canadian or or does it not matter one way or the other? Or how does that work for you? Uh, it's tough no matter where you live in the world. You know, I mean, I think documentary and filmmakers in general uh, were just blessed to be making films. Um, in Canada, we do have a, a system in place for tax credits that, that isn't, is attractive. Um, but that over the years that's changed with the, you know, Atlanta and different states, Georgia and, and, uh, different states coming up with their tax breaks. So it's way more competitive now than it used to be. Uh, but I, I work wherever I can, whenever I can, however I can. So I have a clip here from a film, which I realized after the fact is a couple of years old, but it's a dramatic film becoming Redwood. Do you want to say anything yeah. about, oh, and by the way, I, I had another bio on you. Did I read somewhere that you were a golfer yourself before? 
You, is that, is that yeah. correct? Yeah. And I bring this up. Yeah. I should have left my clubs out in the back here. That I am a brand new golfer at my. Well, you're foolish. My young age. I literally, literally just started a couple of months ago and played should, my first real game up. on a real course. Uh, what day is today? You know, like four days ago with my brother. I mean, literally. I mean, I've been going to the driving range and taking instructions, and and something yeah. bit me—the the golf bug. Oh God, oh, help God. you! <laughs> uh, well, well, let, well, let's roll redwood, and I'll tell you the story after. Here we go. Whoops! I'm gonna restart. Why don't you help me make dinner? We're having short ribs. No thanks. I don't eat meat. Oh. Red, you keep your nose out of things that don't concern you. I would prefer redwood, please. Who's this little pecker? This is Redwood. She's been to hippies around the links. Remember, Redwood, you win the Masters, and we can change everything. If I can be Jack, I'll be able to win that magical jacket. Then I'll be able to change everything back to the way it was before. Back to when my dad was happy. He's crazy like cramps. Here <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what's the story on that? Did you write that too? Oh yeah, yeah. That was about fourteen years of uh, it took me from conception to getting it made. And it brings I, back a lot of memories. I looked it up on, on IMDb Pro. The budget seemed to be incredibly small. Budget, right? Was it correct? I think that I think that's I think that it, that budget on an IMDb is inflated even from what I, we actually. I, made I it think for. it says a hundred grand. Is oh, that that's Rabbit. Yeah, that's Rabbit. Oh, 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 oh. Which 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 was a hundred grand? Which I looked at the trailer of that too, and that looks pretty good for a hundred grand. But then again. You're going, I don't understand, you know, you're doing documentaries, you have 20 guys on a crew and you, how many days did you shoot on, on prior punk? You, you're, you're up there in the good, uh, higher altitudes of the doc budget. World. Yeah. yeah. More yeah, than your, sure. more than your, more than your little feature films, right? And some of your features. Yeah. So yeah. were, you, were, you, were you a golfer? Is that how Redwood came about? I mean. Yeah, I turned pro when I was 19. Um, had a brief, uh, extremely uh, non-productive professional career. Um, you know, had a nervous breakdown at 22. You know, just golf is a complicated subject for me, but um, Redwood is about me growing up. It's it's a it's a totally biographical kind of fictional additional take to, to me growing up thinking that I was going to get my family back together by beating Jack Nicholas in my mind. Yeah. I don't want to get off on a tangent on golf, but you know, my brother keeps saying, now don't get up tight if you do. And I said, I am playing golf because I'm enjoying every minute of it. I'm not trying to yeah, well, that's. I'm not it, becoming listen, a pro. I'm just just trying to hit the ball straight, right? It's kind of it's weird. A, okay. It's a it's a very complicated relationship. That's all I gotta say. I mean, God rest Alvy Thompson, who just passed away. But look him up. He's he was my guru and taught me life lessons that I still have been using today. Uh, chasing evil. Um, Ch how, where did that how did that come about uh the robbie knievel story yeah it's 12 o'clock oh it's 12 o'clock um like any doc you know we i i had a bunch of uh in development and and a broadcaster picked that one and and that's what we greenlit with adam scourgey uh who's a fantastic producer ken johns who um produced it and shot it we uh, 
we set out and made that film, which was, you know, extremely difficult. Um, but uh, it it did really well, and proud of that film. Let's take a quick look. I have had over 350 professional jumps. I hold over 20 world records. You name it, I've jumped it since I started my career at eight years old. I'm doing an interview. I am the greatest jumper of all time. My name is Robbie Knievel. And in my business, you gotta know what the f you're doing or you end up dead. He is a legend. He's did jumps as nobody else has ever done. You know, he jumped across the Grand Canyon, jumped over a train coming at him, jumped building to building. He made his own way. He was the ratings draw before American Idol. It was Robbie Knievel. He built up this tremendous empire chasing after his father's legacy. Yeah. It seems like a change of pace, not quite like golf or stand-ups. Well, Robbie's yeah. one of a kind, man. He's a Knievel. And was he actually living in the trailer there? Um, when you... Yeah. And does he... What does he do? Is he goes from venue to venue in the trailer to to do jumps, or does he have a life, a family, or do you? Uh, Robbie, um, in the film, he he jumped. He injured himself on the jump that we uh, were filming. Um, you know, first Daredevil to to live and perform for five decades, which has never been done and unheard of. Uh, he's not jumping right now. I, I think that he's in recovery with his back. Um, he broke his back when we were filming him. Uh, it's a tough life, man. That's a hard way to, yeah. harder, hard to make a living that harder than even documentary filmmaking, right? Listen, I mean, I, I stood on his jump ramp the night before he jumped and I just could not believe that somebody would do that for a living. It's just, uh, it's just a special breed of person. I have a project that I've been in, had in development for a couple of years with somebody that does dangerous stuff. And I thought it was going to happen and then it fell through the project. And I was actually relieved almost that I didn't have to produce a show with somebody doing a stunt that was life threatening. Well, it, it's, it's a weird situation because uh, um, you, you become friends with that person sometimes and um, watching them go through that is, is difficult. As a filmmaker, it's it's a real double-edged sword, really. Um, I felt that way with Ray. Sorry, go ahead. You want to tell us a little bit about uh, the Punks project and how that came about and a little bit about the shooting, and then I'll run a clip from that. Sure. Uh, it's currently, uh, I'm just, the way I'm looking right now, fatigued, it's because I'm just delivering the fourth episode uh, this week. It's uh, four one hours of um, sort of like a quasi history of punk from Iggy Pop to now. Uh, we've got an amazing cast. I think I did 61 interviews or create something crazy like that. Um, but pretty proud of it. Um, everybody should see it. Here we go. It's, it's a, you know. I it myself. It's like if you get into punk rock to make money, you're really in the wrong business. <laughs> you know, guys going crazy. MC5. The Stooges. The Ramones. The Sex Pistols. And each generation is looking for its own voice. Let's break all the rules. I want to do something different. This is who I am. I always saw it with an attitude. Oh, man, up! I want you! You have to fucking let the kids take over. That's a lot of what it's allowed punk to keep yeah, being reborn. Wow. I want you here! All that mattered to me was the motivation of the person that's playing the music. This is yeah, what wow. I like. See you down! Couldn't be much different than the other material that we've been looking at, which is great that, that you're so eclectic. I mean, can you want to tell us about that, the production in that show? 
God, it's it's been an amazing experience. Um, I when I got the the job, I I didn't. I mean, I knew about punk music, but I didn't really understand it. And now I do. Um, counter counterculture people are usually on the fringes for a reason, and they're extremely intelligent and and complex. The stories are complex and. Um, it's just been a huge honor to be part of this project because um, one of the things that I think people don't understand is that getting these people together in one documentary is was unheard of. And they all came together finally after all these years. Well, how did you get them all together? I mean, I, I think Iggy Pop being the exec producer probably helped a lot. You know, um, he's he's the godfather, right? So once you get the godfather, uh, everybody sort of falls in line. We got Johnny Rotten, we got Marky Ramone. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. And the stories that, I mean, we, we did four one hours, but I can honestly tell you that I shot enough for 10 one hours. And are you cutting where? In Canada? Uh, yeah, we're we're just delivering the fourth episode out of four. Um, production was uh, uh, all over the states and uh, London. We went to London, um, of course. So but you post mentioned post production was. In, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Post production was in Vancouver. So you mentioned having Iggy Pop as the exec, and I noticed that on the uh, prior doc there were like ten producers. Plus, yeah. his, uh, is her name Jennifer? Uh, no. Jennifer, is, yeah. Is, was the exec producer, his ex-wife, or maybe yeah. she, what, what was that like? How did that influence the making of the film? Obviously, I would imagine it opened doors to some interviews, but what was her participation or, or lack thereof, Can I, may I ask? Sure, no problem. Before we go, go there, I just want to mention that John Varvatos uh, was hugely influential and uh, amazing to deal with on punk. So that helped a lot. Um, Jennifer was instrumental in telling that story. Uh, she's just an amazing person. Um, was, you know, great to work with um, on, on Richard's uh, doc. Uh, it's, it's extremely... Um, complex these documentaries putting them together with the estates and with you know family and stuff like that so uh that's what happens when you get into these high-end kind of high profile characters and jen was uh able to help me get through or production help help production get through the landmines that that come with telling these stories yes yeah, she and also she was a terrific interview I mean, so, and you could, Amazing. You, could, you could, you could feel the emotion inside yeah. of her and it wasn't just something she had said a hundred times and it wasn't just, yeah, it was, it was very real. Um, well, she, yeah, she ended up, she went there with me. So she went there with me. So hats off. Was music clearance on the punk thing a nightmare or when you got so-and-so did it come with music clearance or was that it's all a nightmare chuck <laughs> we know that <laughs> it's all a nightmare um yeah it's really complex man i mean it's just documentary filmmaking i don't think people understand how complex it really is how many elements are moving and, sh and uh, around and when you see a film you know it's okay to be critical of something but you also have to you know, take your hat off to these filmmakers who are actually presenting to you something that is sometimes takes, you know, four or five, ten years to make because it's so complex. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to be on this episode of West Stock Online. Um, My I hope, pleasure. I hope you and all the viewers who are watching this enjoy it and tell all your friends so they'll watch and like and subscribe or whatever uh, i've enjoyed it and i'm just great meeting another filmmaker especially a hybrid which you know so um thank you so much
Thanks, Chuck, for having me on. It was a pleasure. It's, a, it's an amazing thing, actually. Diversity. Cincinnati. This is incredible.